You know, it's been nearly 450 years since a remarkable 16th century Frenchman named Michel de Nostradamus, Nostradamus, wrote down some startling predictions for the next 2,000 years. How could one man see into the future? How was he able to forecast historic events and identify important leaders who had not yet been born? Thousands of years after his death, the prophecies of Nostradamus continue to amaze. There was once a man who could not be confined to his own time, and indeed believed he traveled into the future. He has been called the king among prophets, and his followers conjure visions of Armageddon and Apocalypse, with the mere mention of his name, Nostradamus. It is very important for us to study Nostradamus and try to decipher the prophecies, because in so doing, we can change our future. Today, we are at the culmination point of where his visions are coming to their, uh, their conclusion. And we're beginning to see just what kind of a visionary he truly was. His collected verses offer proof, some say, that Nostradamus had visions of the future and saw such monumental events as the French Revolution, the space shuttle disaster, and the Gulf War with its alien weaponry centuries before they would actually come to pass. There are many who believe that his predictions of the future may well affect the lives of us all. He who is called a prophet now was once called a seer. Strictly speaking, a prophet is one who sees things remote from the natural knowledge of men. Michel Nostradamus. Nostradamus lived in the south of France, in the town of Salon de Provence. The cobbled streets here still echo with the footsteps of this true Renaissance man. Though he walked on these stones more than four centuries ago, it is easy to believe that Nostradamus, the seer of Provence, still watches over this crumbling village and still sees the street marked by his name, and the path that winds past the home he lived in and upstairs once concealed his secret study. Sitting at night in a secret study alone, reposing over the brass tripod, a slight flame coming out of the emptiness makes me pronounce prophecies that will not be believed in vain. Michel de Nostradamus, 1555. He used the brass bowl on a tripod filled with water, the bowl filled with water on a tripod to foresee the future. This was what, what the Delphic Oracle did, and it's exactly the same method. You just gazed into it and saw visions. But Nostradamus was slightly exceptional. He not only saw visions, he heard them as well. He was an enigma in his own lifetime part wizard, part scientist. Nostradamus was a visionary poised in an age when superstition and magic ran headlong into the intellectual revolution that would be called the Renaissance. He was very eclectic in the sense that he gathered information from a number of sources. He was into numerology, he was into the Kabbalah, he was into all different kinds of forms of divination. Not surprisingly, few records exist that accurately describe his appearance. The pictures that have survived of Nostradamus show him with this gray beard and the gray hair, and he had this long straight nose, but the most significant feature was his piercing eyes. At the time, they described him as having the kind of eyes that could see through people, and this was probably true because he could see to be on time into the future, and he had a strange effect on people. People follow Nostradamus and other prophets simply because they would like the advantage of knowing what's about to happen. Now, most of our lives are spent trying to get an advantage, trying to get some sort of, of a tool or weapon that we can use to conquer our environment. 
to beat it in some way, to get the advantage, that's the secret word. And if you know something about the future, that's an enormous advantage. It was an advantage that Europeans would recognize and celebrate as part of the Renaissance movement. Perhaps it is the immense eternity of the great God that has aroused the fervor of Nostradamus. Or perhaps a good or bad demon kindles it. Or perhaps his spirit is moved by nature and climbs to the heavens, beyond mortals, and from there repeats to us prodigious facts. I would not have believed him, had not heaven, which assigns good and evil to mankind, been his inspiration. Pierre de Ronsard, Renaissance poet. It was the Renaissance that marked the period of transition from medieval to modern times. The entire view of the universe was beginning to change. Into this world would come the child named Michel de Notre Dame. Michel de Notre Dame was born in 1503 in Saint Rémy de Provence. Provence at that time was not part of France, but was shortly to become such. He was born of a family of notaries and lawyers, of people who were rather well to do. His grandfather, Pierre de Notre Dame, actually uh, had changed the name of the family from Gassonet, a Jewish name, to Notre Dame, Our Lady, which couldn't be more Catholic and couldn't be more French. The family changed its name to avoid persecution by the Inquisition that raged through Europe for over 300 years. In Provence, the Edict of 1501 was enacted by King Louis XII, instructing all Jews to be baptized. In Notre Dame's time, the Inquisition was very active. And this made it very difficult for most people at the time because uh, if they did anything that was even suggestive of what the church didn't like, they could be killed or they could have their land taken away and put into prison. In spite of persecution, the 16th century was alive with the excitement of newly available knowledge in medicine, mathematics, philosophy, and astronomy. Young Michel de Notre Dame would find these studies intoxicating at a very early age. It was one of his grandfathers, Jean de Saint-Rémy, who recognized a special talent within uh, Notre Dame as a child and he took him under his wing. He actually asked that the family allow him to come and have him live in his household. And he was probably taught in some of the ancient rites of Kabbalah uh, into some of the more mystical aspects of Jewish tradition. We know he was given books of magic that he kept until he was an older man. So we think he was schooled in magic and in spells and cantations. In addition to the rudiments of mathematics, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, his grandfather would give him his first taste of what were called the celestial sciences. Hebrew tradition has a rich background dealing with astrology, dealing with the stars of heaven. So his grandfather would have been one that would have led him to look up into the heavens and uh, to witness not only the stars as they are, but the stars as they can impel human consciousness and bring about the destiny of civilization. From this early age, his grandfather would encourage the young boy to pursue a livelihood in the art of medicine. As a physician, of course, he would have to study astrology. That was the first subject to be studied in medical practice. And I'm sure that uh, the clear skies of saint Rémy de Provence attracted his attention. I'm sure that his grandfather encouraged it. Jupiter, being more joined to Venus than to the moon, appearing in white fullness, Venus hidden under the whiteness of Neptune, struck by Mars through the Milky Way. Michel de Nostradamus, 1555. Young Michel de Notre Dame was the first of four sons, 
and early in life it was recognized that he possessed a gift. Nostradamus had visions of the future, even from early childhood. He didn't understand where these were coming from. He would have nightmares and dreams where he would see things, and he couldn't explain them to people. His grandfather was the one that recognized the abilities in the child as a young boy and uh, would have helped him not only in his studies but also in his development of those abilities. By 1517, Michel de Notre Dame turned 14 and was sent away to the ancient walled and towered city of Avignon to enroll in a curriculum of rhetoric, mathematics, music, and astronomy. Nostradamus had unorthodox beliefs about astronomy because in his day, according to the Inquisition, they believed the Earth was the center of the universe, the sun, everything revolved around the Earth. He didn't believe that was so. And I think it was because of his visions of the future he was able to see a lot of these things. He came to the belief to know that the Earth revolved around the sun and that there was much more to the universe out there. It would not be for a quarter of a century that the Polish astronomer Copernicus would publish his theory of the solar system in a book called Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. Not yet 20 years old in 1522, Nostradamus, still a young student, would quickly progress to medical school. I, Michel de Notre Dame, of the country of Provence, of the city of saint Barme have come to study at the University of Montpellier, of which I agree to observe the rules, the rights, and the privileges, both present and future. At age 19, Nostradamus was enrolled in the University of Montpellier, which was considered one of the major medical colleges of the day. Also, most of the faculty was of, of Jewish background, so he fit right in and much of the learning, much of the education, the scholars of the day, this was the, the center for uh, medical research. In medical practice of the 16th century, astrology came first. The doctors had to know astrology, had to be able to apply it, and they certainly had to know the birth date and the geographical location of the birth of the patient. That was all important. Because diagnosis was done primarily through the astrological signs and portents. One of his aspects of education was not only in the science of healing, but also the metaphysics of healing, because he realized that it was not simply the healing of the body that was important, it was also a healing of the spirit and the soul. A prodigious student, Michel de Notre Dame received his medical degree after only three years and was honored with the four-cornered hat of a physician but he was yet to be known as Nostradamus. Upon his graduation as a physician from the University of Montpellier, Michel de Notre Dame would take the Latinized version of his name. Notre Dame, Our Lady, would become Nostradamus. The year that Nostradamus obtained his medical license, an epidemic of the plague was devastating southern France. A chilling description of such an epidemic was left behind by Nostradamus' son, César. Persons stricken by the furor of this malady completely abandon all hope of recovery. Their houses are abandoned and empty, men disfigured, women in tears. The stretcher bearers work on credit. César de Notre Dame, 1546. In the day of Nostradamus, of course, one of the greatest fears of everyone was being afflicted by the plague. It was almost universally fatal. When it hit a family, the whole family would go. They didn't know what the cause of it was. It was spread by rats and the rats' fleas, of course. And Nostradamus and other physicians were busy every minute of every day. And they traveled all over Europe ministering to the sick. At that time that Nostradamus was living, the plague uh, actually was considered a, a series of different kinds of diseases. But the most prevalent was what was called a Charbon, which was the, the Black Plague. And unfortunately, uh, most of the medical doctors at that time had no method whatsoever of combating it. 
most of them dressed in horrible looking garb with uh, meat out of leather, soaked in garlic, and they had treated their patients with potions made of mercury. Medical science at the time was crude. Thousands died not only from the disease itself, but from the practice of bloodletting and other treatments of primitive doctors. If Nostradamus had never predicted anything, he would be remembered as one of the great healers of the 16th century. He had many progressive ideas about hygiene. He would not bleed his patients. He would make sure when he came into a town that the people had clean water, that any corpses in the streets would be immediately removed. He would often come into a town and send people out to collect rose petals to make his famous rose pills. Of course, in Nostradamus's time, there was no such thing as the science of pharmacy. There weren't any pharmacists, and every doctor had to mix his own chemicals to make his own medications. It had to be done at the right phase of the moon, with the stars and the planets in just the right juxtaposition. Otherwise, they thought that it wouldn't be effective. Nostradamus used lozenges that was composed of ground up not only the rose petals, but also the rose hips, which contains the ascorbic acid, which is what we use today in vitamin C, which we know is uh, something that fights uh, infections. When he was 52, Nostradamus wrote down the formula of his rose lozenges. Three to four hundred red roses, plucked before dawn, are pulverized and mixed with sawdust from the greenest cypress, iris of Florence, cloves, odorated calamus root, and linalos. Nostradamus, 1555. Little more is known of his remedy, but his cure rate was impressive. Some hold that another secret was a belief in cleanliness. He was able to avoid contracting the plague himself because he practiced hygiene himself. And uh, this is one thing that he insisted on that for himself before going into the patient, uh, that he himself was clean as well as the patient themselves were clean. Nostradamus enjoyed a growing reputation as he traveled throughout France treating the plague. While well, Nostradamus was traveling throughout southwest France, he received word from Jules César Scalinger, one of the leading scholars of the day, that he wanted to meet with him and to communicate with him and basically just share the knowledge and wisdom together. And so he invited Nostradamus uh, to his hometown of Agen. And Nostradamus accepted the invitation and the two of them got on quite well. Scaliger seems to have inherited Cicero's ability in eloquence, Virgil's in poetry, and Galen's twice over in medicine. I owe him more than anyone else in the world. Nostradamus, 1552. It was in fact at Scaliger's home in Agen that, at the age of 30, Nostradamus was married. Strangely, his wife's name has been lost to history. Nostradamus' first marriage um, bore him children. His wife was uh, apparently very much beloved. It was a marriage of uh, love rather than convenience. And unfortunately, while he was away, probably in Italy at the time, the plague swept through that particular part of Provence, and we returned to find that his entire family had fallen victim to the plague. He lost all of them. It was a bitter irony that his medical skill could not be used to save his own family. His reputation suffered along with his heart. If Nostradamus was indeed a prophet, he knew then there would soon be change. Until this point in his life, Nostradamus was known only as a healer and an intellectual. 
but the death of his wife and children from the plague marked a time of deep introspection and personal change. No one could have foreseen that when he emerged from this period, Nostradamus would be called a prophet. In 1538, while Nostradamus was still living in the south of France, he was informed that officials of the Inquisition wanted to question him. Wisely, he chose to avoid them, and still mourning the loss of his family, he set out on a wanderlust throughout Europe and beyond. Some believe this was a period of psychic awakening. One of the legends of Nostradamus' uh, psychic abilities occurred uh, when he was traveling in Italy. And uh, he came upon a group of Italian monks, and uh, to one of them he went up to and said, Father. The monk was a Franciscan called Felici Peretti. Nostradamus fell to his knees and paid homage to the lowly friar, explaining that he must kneel at the feet of His Holiness the Pope. Indeed, in 1585, the young monk became Pope Sixtus V, fulfilling the prediction of Nostradamus. Nostradamus did not stay in Italy, but chose to broaden his search for knowledge. This was the time frame that he may have tapped back into his earlier childhood education of going to the ancient places of divination, the ancient mystery schools in Greece, in Turkey, and also particularly in Egypt. And we know that after, when he returned to France, he brought with him many of the different tools of divination. Upon his return to the south of France, Nostradamus took up residence in Salon de Provence, and here, in 1550, began to publish farmer's almanacs that included predictions for the future. I think that Nostradamus saw a sterling opportunity to start turning out almanacs, which were astrological predictions one after the other for the coming year. They'd be published sometime in December, and people would snap them up. Well, printing had just been introduced in that part of the world, in Provence, and he took advantage of it, and apparently he made himself a good deal of money publishing almanacs. But at night, the seer of Provence sat alone upstairs in his secret study and began to cultivate his famous visions of the future. The wand in the hand is placed in the middle of the legs of the tripod. He sprinkles both the hem of his robes and his foot with water. A voice, fear, he trembles in his robes. Divine splendor, the gods sit down beside him. Nostradamus, 1555. Most of the work that Nostradamus did in his divination, he did at night. And he lit candles throughout the upper floor of the room, which was his laboratory, you might say. And he filled the, the brass bowl with water. He then passed the wand over the bowl, and by moving a vibration across the surface of the water, this helped to open the veils of time. By looking at the reflection, he would go into trance. And by doing so, he would travel out of his body and into the future, into time. This is how he would see the visions that he saw. He would see them occurring one after the other in all their horror, not knowing what they represented, not knowing what time period he was looking at. But when he came back into his body, maybe as long as two hours later, he would find that he had written a four-line poem, the quatrain. Nostradamus wrote 1,000 quatrains, dividing them into 10 groups of 100 each, which he called centuries. He wrote in his native French, but to protect himself from the superstitious witch hunters of the day, he obscured the verse with Latin and Greek and even anagrams. The first edition of his Centuries was published in 1566, and continues to be published to this day. The publication of the centuries brought him such attention, particularly from royalty, that he began to get commissions for horoscopes being cast, 
specific questions about families and futures being answered. It was quite a roaring business. Nostradamus' predictions caught the attention of Catherine de Medici, the reigning queen of France. Her interest in the occult and astrology was known throughout Europe. After the first edition of Les Vraies Sanceries was released, uh, she immediately summoned him to the uh, French court. And while he was there, she commissioned him to do a prophetic reading on all of her children. Nostradamus passed each of the queen's seven sons by his magic mirror. Very often, by looking into the mirror, he could not only catch an image of what the character of the person was now in the present moment, but could tell what the character of that person was going to be, what was their destiny line within their future life. Nostradamus pronounced that four of them would die, leaving only three. History proved his prediction to be correct. The seven branches will be reduced to three. As obscure as these verses sound to many of us, they were very clear to others. Nostradamus' 35th quatrain of the first century was immediately seized upon as suggesting that the reigning king of France, Henry II, would die in a jousting tournament. The young lion will overcome the old one in single combat. In a cage of gold, his eyes will be put out. Two wounds in one then to die a cruel death. The fatal accident occurred in the summer of 1559 as the king celebrated his daughter's wedding with a joust. He would ride against Count Montgomery, the captain of his Scottish guard. They lined up on the lists. The horses galloped down, flinging sawdust and earth. There was stillness, thousands of eyes looking. There was a sudden crack, followed by thousands of gasping voices as they saw a huge splinter protruding out of the golden visor of the king's helmet. He fell to the ground, carried off, mortally wounded. The shaft had entered just behind his left eye, instantly blinding it, plunging deep into his brain. He suffered in agony for 10 days, slowly dying from infections. The young lion will overcome the old one in single combat. Every point of the prophecy came true. The young lion against the old lion. The fact that they were in a field of single combat. In other words, it is a tournament, a joust. In a cage of gold, his eyes will be put out. Two wounds in one, then to die a cruel death. Two wounds made one. The eye is blinded, the brain is pierced. Two wounds made one. And he was blinded as the splinter did plunge through the gold cage of his helmet. In Nostradamus' time, it was believed that only witches and heretics could see through time. To claim clairvoyance was heresy against the church. On the night of the king's death, a crowd gathered in front of the Inquisition demanding that Nostradamus be burned. That night, Count Montgomery was heard to exclaim, Cursed be the Divine One who predicted it so evilly and so well. As a favorite of Catherine de' Medici, Nostradamus was spared. Catherine's interest in Nostradamus was such that when she and the new king of France, Charles IX, her son, mounted the throne, they actually made a tour of France, covered all, every major city in the entire kingdom. When they came to Salon, they asked to meet Nostradamus personally. As we were passing through Salon, we have seen Nostradamus, who has promised to my son, King Charles IX, long life. Catherine de Medici, 1564. 
Though favored by the Queen, Nostradamus still continued to obscure his written predictions against persecution by the Inquisition. Although I have often foretold, long before what hath afterwards come to pass, I was willing to hold my peace. But afterwards, I was willing for the common good to enlarge myself in dark and abstruse sentences, declaring the future events chiefly the most urgent. Michel Nostradamus, March, 1555. Nostradamus wrote down over a thousand predictions, and there are experts who believe that over half have come true. The most startling deals with three powerful and tyrannical leaders, men he called antichrists. He called these antichrists because he didn't have any other name for them. But he met people that would do horrible things against humanity, against people. The first antichrist was Napoleon. An emperor will be born near Italy. He will cost his empire very dearly. They will say that from the people that surround him, he will be found less a prince than a butcher. From a simple soldier, he will attain the empire. From a short robe, he will attain the long. Born in Italy, Napoleon did in fact begin in the short robe of a soldier then later took on the long robes of an emperor. This seems to have been a window time frame that he was particularly interested in. And there are a number of verses, uh, particularly that even name Napoleon and describe his career as rising and falling to a, a great degree of, of accuracy. For 14 years, he will hold the tyranny. Indeed, Napoleon's reign of war and terror began in November of 1799 and lasted 14 years and five months when he was exiled on Elba in April of 1814. The second of Nostradamus's antichrists was Adolf Hitler, though Nostradamus referred to him in his quatrains as Hister. A captain of greater Germany will, by his speeches, seduce great numbers. The most part of the battlefield will be against Hister. They shall subjugate the borders of the Danube. They shall pursue the crooked cross of iron. Nostradamus talks of Hister, H-I-S-T-E-R the German of the Crooked Cross, the captain of Greater Germany, who shall come from Poland through feigned force. Now, if you can tell me anyone else called Hister or Hitler who gets into Poland, this captain of the Crooked Cross, <laughs> I'm asking you a lot. It obviously was Hitler. Hister, the enigmatic name that he uses, is a play on the ancient name for the Danube River, the Hister. This is the river that Hitler grew up playing next to, dreaming his dreams of conquest. Nostradamus's third antichrist has yet to appear. Still, his record remains impressive. Many think the verses of Nostradamus foretold the French Revolution of 1789, 234 years before it happened. His quatrains describe in lurid detail the executions by guillotine of Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. Paris was never in such great disorder. The Republic of the Great City, with great harshness, shall not permit exit to the King. Elected French king causes tempest, fire, blood, slice. His opus, The Centuries, describes not only events in the future, but the methods he employed for divination. 
I extend my hand, holding the rod of branches. The answer comes to me as my arm trembles. One of the very first quatrains that is given in his book, The Centuries, actually talks about him sitting and using what he calls branches, or the branches, holding them in his hand, and there being a movement within the branches and within his hands. Uh, this sounds very much like he was using a form of dowsing. It was through methods like this that Nostradamus may have foreseen the British adventures in the New World, only just discovered in the years before his birth. In several quatrains, he is said to have written about the British colonists striking out on their own in a war for independence. The West shall be free from the British Isles. There are many of his verses and also his prose writings where Nostradamus describes America, not only in terms of it being a colony, but also eventually being a free land, what he called the land of liberty. And he mentioned it by name in two of the verses. Nostradamus wrote of people he could never have guessed at, places that at his time didn't even exist. Dallas, Texas, November 22nd, 1963. The ancient work shall be accomplished from the roof. Evil lightning shall fall on the great man. Being dead, they will accuse an innocent man of the deed, the guilty one hidden in the misty woods. Some of Nostradamus' most significant prophecies deal with the assassination of the Kennedy brothers. One alludes to his, the first Kennedy, John Kennedy, the president, being killed by a thunderbolt in broad daylight. And indeed, the shots from the book depository building did hit him from the sky. Nostradamus wrote these verses in an upstairs study 400 years ago about a country not yet born 3,000 miles away. Many believe his visions reach even further. It is hard to imagine that the prophecies of Nostradamus were actually written in the 16th century, a time radically different from our own. Still, his predictions defy explanation. Some of the most startling predictions of Nostradamus dealt with these mechanical and technological inventions of our time. They will see the pig-like half-man, noise, shouts, battles seen in the heavens. He couldn't understand them. He had no words in his language to describe them, so he had to refer to them with things that he knew. He shall go out in an iron fish, thrown upon the shore by a great wave. It shall be as a barn under the sea, its strange form wild and horrifying. From the sea its enemies soon reach the walls. There is one fascinating verse that speaks about a certain person stepping down and placing their foot on an alien soil, which he says is on the corner of the moon. In the heavens shall be seen a running fire with long sparks. He will come to take himself to the corner of Luna, where he will be taken and placed on alien land. Base here. The has landed. Nostradamus may also have predicted that all such exploration would not be successful. Nine will be set apart from the human flock. Their fate will be sealed at the moment of their departure. Separated from judgment and advice. Kappa, Theta, Lambda. Banished and scattered. Kappa, Theta, Lambda, mixed in an anagrammic form, create the final word, Morton Firecall, 
the company responsible for building the solid rocket boosters. And as we can see in those terrible pictures of the Challenger, the scattered debris falling trails to the sea, they indeed were scattered. Scholars of Nostradamus believe he may also have predicted the Gulf War. Very nearly a million men toward Persia. The true serpent will invade Byzantium and Egypt. He will enter wicked, infamous villain, tyrannizing over Mesopotamia, the land horrible and black in appearance. There are a number of verses which refers to a tyrant. And one of the verses he actually calls him Dam, D-A-M, which comes pretty close to being Saddam. But Nostradamus' predictions don't end here. Worldwide famine, Nostradamus predicts throughout the end of the century. It seems to be one of his sort of key words, earthquakes and famines seem to be the things that this decade of this century is going to be renowned for. And so far, it's turned out very much the case. The overwhelming quantity of catastrophic prophecies in the quatrains would lead many to think our future is bleak. It must be understood that Nostradamus quatrains are the worst case scenarios. They are what will happen if mankind doesn't do anything to stop it. The future is not set in stone, it is changeable. This is part of a work of a psyche to tell people what's going to happen so they can do something about it to stop it. This is very important to realize. The year 1566 saw a warm and mild summer in Salon de Provence. And during this time, Nostradamus penned his final quatrain at the age of 63. Then, mysteriously, he closed his books forever. In his prose writing, he does describe that at one point, he took many of the ancient manuscripts that he worked from as part of his form of divination, and he said he cast them into the fireplace. I have at my disposal volumes, which have long been hidden. But dreading what use might be made of them, I consigned them to the flames. As the fires arose to engulf the pages themselves, there was a tremendous glow that not only filled the fireplace and filled the room, but filled his entire house with a very strange uh, etheric glow. And it was like the release of the spirit of the ancient wisdom itself. Now an old man, Nostradamus had become weak. His heart was failing. He didn't know what to do about it because it couldn't be treated in his day. He didn't recognize the symptoms except as something that some of his patients had, and now he had it. He was uh, constrained to stay in one room. He uh, lived on a pallet uh, at the side of the room near a window, and he had to be hand-fed, and he eventually died of congestive heart failure. In a small stone church in Salon, a stone marks the tomb of the seer of Provence, Nostradamus. Twenty years of the reign of the moon have passed. When the sun takes up its exhausted days, then my prophecies will end and be accomplished. Nostradamus. I guess no other prophet since biblical times has held as constant a place in the hearts and minds of the public as Nostradamus. He was the rarest of individuals, whether because of the sheer audacity of his future visions or simply that the dreamlike imagery of his verses captured our imaginations, Nostradamus continues to triumph over time. <laughs>